In May of 1995, <clears throat> I had just come back from a gathering of ministers in Indianapolis. And I was able to walk into my house, look at my youngest son, Ryan, and say to him, we have a church. We have a church. A group of us were gathered in Indianapolis at that time uh, to create, to form uh, a new congregation, a new fellowship, a new church of God that uh, we'd already chosen the name at that point called the United Church of God. And it was a very dramatic time nearly 25 years ago when we came together at that point over in Indianapolis to uh, deal with a massive doctrinal breakdown that had taken place and to create a place where we could continue on with what we felt was important to us in our calling and our responsibilities before God. About 150 elders at that time gathered there. We left that three-day conference in Indianapolis in May of 1995 with three mandates that we wanted to do. Number one was to provide a spiritual home for the scattering members of the Church of God at that time. And so that was one of our main reasons. The second was to prepare to keep the holy days, the festivals especially, the Feast of Tabernacles in just a few months from that point. And the third mandate that we had out of that was to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ. And we organized to, to do that nearly 25 years ago. Now, it's hard to believe from my perspective that it's been that long uh, or it, I guess that short, depending on, again, what your perspective might be. Uh, it's gone by just like that in terms of time, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, here we are. Uh, we're in actually our 25th year of the United Church of God. Uh, next May the, uh, will be the 25th anniversary, but you can say we're in our 25th year. And actually, uh, beginning this, this week as part of the agenda of the Council of Elders, we're going to begin to discuss how we want to um, remember that date and celebrate 25 years next May with the, the elders that we hope we will uh, get more elders to come in from around the world to kind of uh, think and look ahead, uh, especially toward the next 25 years. Uh, it's our, our purpose is not to look back uh, so much as it is to look forward uh, to the next 25 years and see what we can do to prepare for that. But uh, that's, that's where we are, 25 years. They have not been without their challenges. Um, but you know, we are, still, we are still here. A few years ago, we were meeting in the conference room here with a group of people we had uh, brought in to consult with on some matters in, our, uh, in the church, and I remember as we were explaining to them who we were, what was the United Church of God? Is this uh, a building, this, this a fellowship, this group here in Milford, Ohio, in Cincinnati, on the east side? What, who are we? What are we are about? Where did we come from? And so we sought to begin to explain it to him. And in the process, Peter Eddington made a comment to them uh, about the, what we were about in terms of our mission and, and what we wanted to accomplish and uh, some of the challenges that we'd had. And he said, those of you that are those of us that are around the table here, he said, we are still here doing what we said we would do from the beginning, 25 years ago now. And I've always remembered that, that statement. We're still here, he said, doing what we said we would do. And part of that, large part of it, were the three things that I said that we came out of the Indianapolis Conference with our mindset to, to accomplish. And so as the council will begin this discussion as we will, uh, we've already begun to talk about it. Uh, we've done a couple of podcasts, uh, uh, Mr. Kubik and, and I and others have done some podcasts to talk about that. Uh, last um, May with the, the uh, ABC class here, the, uh, the most recent graduating class, I took a period right at the end of the year to talk with the graduating class this year about what they would like to see uh, the United Church of God doing in the next 25 years, and some of their comments were very helpful. They certainly uh, uh, brought out the fact that they wanted a church for their children. Uh, they wanted a place where the faith could uh, continue to be taught, the true faith of God uh, be, to be enshrined. They expressed concerns about unity within the church. 
They were also eager to give advice and, and helpful tips about how to uh, use media uh, to uh, reach a, a younger audience and to advance the, the, the gospel. Uh, a number uh, also commented to me that day about the importance of building relationships and uh, the, the, the value of that. Uh, one, uh, one man, one young man, student said that this, and I, I remember I thought it was probably the capstone comment of the whole session. He said, you know, I look around at the church, United Church of God today, he said, and he said, I think it's in the best place that it's ever been. I think it's in the best place that it's ever been. And that was, again, unsolicited, but I, I think that there's a lot of truth there to think about. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is to look at a, a few possible themes that we could focus on as we as a, a church prepare ourselves and, and look forward uh, to the challenges and the opportunities of the next 25 years. There could be more than just three, and there could be uh, others than what I will talk about here today, but in some of our discussions with uh, uh, some of the, us in, the, in this building and others that are on a, a planning committee for the upcoming general conference, these are some of the ideas that, that we've tossed out and I've thought about, and so I thought I would share them with you this afternoon because I think that at least bef uh, gives us a platform to begin a discussion and some very important things to think about that are rooted not just in what we might think where we are right now, but also I think given those three mandates that I said we came out of the Indianapolis conference with 25 years ago, I think they match up pretty closely to what we said we wanted to do then and what we need to begin even focus, with a more focused approach to do going forward from this point uh, and, and for the next, next 25 years. Here's the first theme, and it's this, that <clears throat> we are going to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God to an increasingly secular world. Now that's a, a general statement, it's a true statement, and it probably could be put just a little bit better, but let's work with that for, for a moment. We're going to have to address relevant issues that are impacting the world today, your world, my world, uh, everything that we observe, and we're going to have to address them from the foundation of the Word of God, from the foundation of the Word of God. Not from what we might pick up as we watch any particular uh, news source or individual or ideology or philosophy or even uh, other spiritual ideas. It's all going to have to come from the Word of God as we address relevant issues. Issues like immigration, issues like gender issues, the LBGDQ issues that are just foaming and raging around our, our world today. The addictions, the depression, and the suicides that come as a result of those in the midst of the stresses, the problems that our modern interconnected world has created for itself. I, uh, you know, the, the addictions are things that we, we've talked about in our Beyond Today and, and on some of our programming and um, we, we deal with and we tragically see around us and at times even uh, breaches the walls of the church and impacts us. And yet the uh, society just hasn't, you know, in, in some ways taken all the steps to, create to, uh, to deal with this. But a year and a half ago I had a, had a root canal, the first one in my life, and as I was walking out of the dentist's office, they handed me a prescription for an opioid. And I, th I thought, what is this? And I, th I thought, well, and I went home, I said, well, I better, I told my wife, I better go and get this filled because I'm probably going to need it. She looked at it, she said, no, you're not. It's an opioid. It's what creates addictions. And then she had some dental work done just a few days ago, and they gave her the same prescription. Free and easy. Uh, to, go, to go fill. One of our employees had some dental work done here this week as well and was talking about that very same thing. And we don't get it in some cases. Uh, and things are accessible and they lead to other problems. Um, marijuana has, is being made legal. And we, you know, that, can, that debate can rage back and forth and we can talk about that. But all of these things are, are taking place around us in our world and how we address those things are going to have to be done from the foundation of the Word of God. 
We're dealing with a, a globalized world that, that uh, a transnational effort to break down barriers and frankly what it boils down to is a, a march toward the Babylon that is prophesied to come in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And that's the world we are seeing developing in, in right in front of us. We're also dealing in a, in a world that is increasingly caught up in spiritual deceptions that are more subtle than any that I have ever studied, examined, or seen in, in, in my years. Spiritual deceptions of different sorts and types, I think is the best way to put it. It's not just religious deception. It's not the issue of true and false and uh, error and paganism and, and all of this. It is a, a spiritual deception that is creeping over the world that is very subtle, very subtle. And, and it, it is impacting the world and it is impacting the elect of God, the church of God as well, in ways that would shock some of us, maybe not shock others. But uh, I, there's not too many things that shock me anymore, but every once in a while I've even seen things among, in our own fellowship that I can't believe it. But spiritual deception, and we have to address those things. And the United Church of God will have to sharpen its focus on proclaiming God's vision to a world that is increasingly hostile to biblical truth, a standard of truth, an absolute standard of truth that is rock solid foundation from which there is no equivocation, no argument, the Bible. And we will have to defend that. We will have to know why we believe it and why we teach it and why we live it and be able to defend it and hold the line. That will become increasingly uh, more of a challenge. And what we have to really do is present to a world the, the truth that man is created in the image of God. What we need to present to the world is what we read back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. As we find with so many the uh, the issues that are uh, facing us today in, in the world and, and the world is, is catapulting toward, the answers are still found right in the book of Genesis, in the first pages of the book of Genesis. And we have to keep going back there to never forget them and to remember them. But in Genesis 1 and verse 27, it says that, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. I had one of our pastors call me this week to get some advice about how to deal with um, an individual that was beginning to sit in the congregation that he's in. And um, the individual, uh, you know, I just said, you're going to have to go back and explain to this person as they will talk with you about certain these issues, male and female. Are they created? That's, that's where you begin. You cannot hide from that. You cannot deny that. Uh, man has created an image of God, male and female. That is part of God's creation. These are the issues that come through our doors at times that uh, our ministry deals with, we deal with, you deal with in your workplace, in school, uh, continually. Man created in the image of God, male and female. Created he them. In chapter 2 and verse 24, uh, it speaks regarding marriage here at the very beginning. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Christ quoted this in Matthew 19 when he cut through all the problems of his day and said, in the beginning it was not so. What did God say? In the beginning, male and female, they were created, joined together to become one flesh. Whether it's gender issues, whether it's marriage and what marriage really is from a biblical standard, these are the scriptures that begin the discussion and that we go back to and we build from, and that is what we have to make relevant because we're created in the image of God to share in that glory. That is God's purpose, to share his glory. And the compelling message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God is what we offer. It's what we give. And we will have to continue to sharpen our focus on that, hold to that, in a world that doesn't want to hear those words and accept them and believe them. Rather, they would rather object uh, and reject them. In Titus chapter 2, Paul spoke to this in the second uh, chapter of Titus. <clears throat> and I think it presents our challenge as we go forward 
as we look at where we are, Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And this comes down to, to our level, your level, mine, in, in, as we sit in congregations, as we live our faith out in our, in our lives, in your workplace, in your school, as you interact with people, as they see you and know you and become to know that there's something different about you. It has to flow from what Paul describes here in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, where he said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. When you read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and you believe what it says, you deny ungodliness in a world today. We do. When we write that, teach that, preach that, believe that, live that, we deny ungodliness ungodly ideas, and we have to label them for what they are and not, not apologize for what we do believe. He says, teaching us by the grace of God that, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. He wrote this in the first century to the, to the church. It's the word of God. It applies to us today in, in 2020. We are to live godly in this present age, righteous, godly lives today. We have no choice. That is, our, that is our calling. As we look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. This is our challenge as we go forward into the next 25 years to live in this way. And as we preach a message, as we teach that message, as we live that message, because we will, you know, we, we can write an article, we can do a program, we can preach it uh, from the pulpits, and the ministry can do that. But each of us has to then live it. We have to support the church the message of the gospel that goes out by living, as the, this verse and others say, and preach, or preach that, that gospel, if you will, by our example, and be a praying church. Really what we, we have to become is a, a praying church that's on its knees, like the church of the book of Acts that we read about. Many of you have been in the class and you know what the, what the book of Acts says as, as we go through that. And as, as we study that, we find that it is a church that was on its knees so very often, so many times praying thy kingdom come, praying for deliverance, praying for protection, praying for the guidance of the, the Spirit of God to get through a challenge to the leadership, to the individuals for the day-to-day -day existence. A church like the book, book of Acts, where we're lights. We have to find the, the common points with people that we interact with in our life. Find commonality with the people that we come into contact with, our neighbors, our co-workers. We have to, I think, begin to uh, look at people who are not a part of us as our neighbors. And to love them as we love each other and as we love God, we may not love what they do, but we have to come to the point where we, I think, quit using the terms that cause us to look at so much at the world out there and people that are unconverted or so-called this or so-called that, that label people and put up walls and barriers. We have to be able to find the commonality with people and their humanity while at the same time we are lights. My wife was recently explaining to some a group of ladies that she gets together with a couple of times a week uh, that are not part of the uh, United Church of God, and they know that we occasionally go to Africa, and we do work over there, and um, they use the term, oh, you're over there doing mission work. Okay, well, that, whatever that work, you know, that uh, you understand it from that point of view, and uh, yeah, we do have a mission, and, and we are over there doing some work, and, but she explains why we go there and what we're doing, and uh, one lady had, you know, just kind of broke down in tears and realizing that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And you have to be able to explain the things that we do. Make your faith resonate with people that you meet every day. 
because you're living it. We're part of a praying church that is preaching the gospel and being an increasingly bright light in a world that does not like the truth of God. Those are, that's one challenge that I think that we have and we're going to have to think deeply about. Let's look at another theme. We're going to have to, in the next 25 years, continue to build on the foundation, building that household of faith that we have only begun to, to, to accomplish. We have to build a household of faith. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy, the third chapter. Paul talks about the church of God. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 14, 1 Timothy chapter 3. These things Paul writes to Timothy, I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but I am delayed. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. This is one of those scriptures that really anchor us in, in terms of what is the church, and what it should be. This is, this is kind of a, a church scripture. If, you, if you're one that colors your Bibles or puts little markings in there, you might want to put out in the margin church or whatever color you might have, purple, lavender, pink, rose, um, mauve, <laughs> whatever they are <laughs> uh, today gray, <laughs> um, to mark this. It, it's a church scripture. It's a church scripture. He says, I want you to know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is a pretty good description of what the church is, what it should be always. It is, the, it is a house. Now, other scriptures talk about uh, that we are individual temples of the Holy Spirit and all, but the church is also has that designation. It is the house of God. It is where we come together. We are individual members of a spiritual body or the spiritual church, the, the house of God. Uh, it is the church of the living God, and it is the place where there, it, is the, it is the pillar. It sinks deep into the, into the ground to support the weight of the building, the ground of the truth. That's what uh, what the church is, and this is what we are building. He said it goes on in verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. So this is what we are doing. We are, we are building the, the church of God, the house of God. Pillar by pillar. Revelation 3 talks about those that are pillars within the temple of God as a de designation of a part of the, of the church and a uh, way of understanding that as well. You know, a few years ago, we, again, going back to the um, consulting that, that we did with um, a group to come in and talk to us about our media message and what we're doing and seeking to help, um, help us with that, we, we brought a group in and, and they looked at us, they looked at every bit of our literature, our website and the church and our history and this and that, researched us and to help us come up with what was uh, the, the essence of the United Church of God. What's the, what's the core essence of the United Church of God? And they came back with two words, meaningful relationship. We paid a lot of money to get those two words. <laughs> meaningful relationships. And, you know, we, we put that on little coffee mugs and we put that on um, a computer pads that you run your mouse over. And I, still, I think I still have one. We might have some stuck upstairs someplace. Peter, Peter probably still has some of those. You know, it's right. And we brought in a consulting firm. They looked at us and they said, you, you folks are about meaningful relationships. And they're right. And it's right. It's, it's all about relationships. I was one of the first camp directors of the youth, United Youth Camp Program back in 1996 uh, when I was appointed to direct Camp Heritage over here in Pennsylvania, which Debbie and I did for nine years. 
and we had a big camp. Uh, lots of kids came from all over. It was, it was kind of the Northwest camp of the day, all right, or the, you know, where everybody wanted to go. It was, it was the Katubik, you know, for this region at that time, and, and we had, um, had a pretty good run. I learned early on, we had a very nice facility. We had um, a Boy Scout reservation that we used a part of their, their facility, and we had a lot of activities, and we had um, uh, all of this going on. We were building a good program, and, but I learned very early on, it wasn't about my role as a camp director or any of our counselors or anybody else. It was the whole cumulative impact of that experience as campers and staff came together was all about relationships. And I came to conclude after about the second year, you know, I think I could, I said to somebody, you know, we got a nice facility here in the woods of eastern Pennsylvania in the mountains, but I, I think that I could go to Indianapolis where I was living at the time and rent a mall parking lot, black asphalt, and set up tents and a big awning and call it Camp Indianapolis or whatever, and everybody would come and they'd have a good time because that's where their friends were. It's where their relationships were, that they were building and developing. Now, we didn't do that, fortunately. We kept it in the woods and at Heritage, and we have all of our camps still going today. But it's about those relationships that we were building then and, and continue to build. I was talking the other day with Steve Nutzman, uh, who coordinates our camp program, and he, he was putting together some numbers. Uh, we've just completed 25 summers of United Youth Camps. And he said, we've put through, he said, we've had 17,000 campers, 17,000. Now, a lot of those were duplicates, but year to year, when you add up all the numbers from each of the 25 summers of campers, 17,000 campers over 25 summers. Now, I'm not trying to present, you know, I hope you understand how I'm presenting that figure. We, uh, but that, that's essentially, we had, you know, divide that by 25, and that's what we would have each summer. And I recognize that some went multiple years, et cetera, and even today, multiple camps, but over a, over a summer time. But it's a lot. It's a lot of programming. It's a lot of activities. It's a lot of relationships that have been built. I've always said that camp is the most successful program, I think, in the United Church of God. It frankly was the first program that was put together by the, the Interim Council of Elders in uh, early, early or late May of 1995, we left Indianapolis and we had appointed an interim council and they met a week or two later over a, uh, on a teleconference. First decision they, they made officially was to fund and, and to put in place summer camps. And from that late May point, we, we rushed through and we had half a dozen camps that summer across the United States. And that the camp program was the first and I think the most successful program that we have had in, in the United Church of God to develop those relationships, to build a household of faith. We have Ambassador Bible College here. We just completed, uh, what was it, our 20th year uh, with this past class. Now the, uh, the 21st class, I guess, will be starting here in just a few short days. Uh, Mr. Antion gave the commencement address back in, in May, and he put out the number that we, uh, we've had uh, through May of this year, 698 attend ABC in its years, in 20, 20 years, 698 in 20 years. That's quite a few to go through that entire program of going through the Bible and uh, what ABC offers. Um, that, that's remarkable. That's solid. Out of that, we have a number of home office employees that have worked for us either today or in the past. We've had a number of people who attended ABC that have become elders now in the church. But most importantly, we have many members of the church around the world who are faithful to the truths of God for, and, and, and stronger in their faith. More than, uh, more than those who may not be at this point in time, for the ABC experience are solid pillars in their congregations uh, and their lives have been improved by what has been done. And when you look at the camp program as well, the seeds that have been sown, the work that has been done in the lives of all those youths in 25 years, uh, they will bear fruit. They will bear fruit and have already done so. And they have benefited uh, the, the church in helping us to build this household of faith that we will continue to build on. 
Probably the, the biggest challenge we might look at to that is maintaining our unity. And as I said, the, the, the class that I polled this year at ABC, this is one of the things that they mentioned, concerns about, about that unity. And I, I think it's, it is a challenge that we all must shoulder individually to be sure that we strengthen and maintain the relationships that we have, that we hold them close, that we hold them to be important to us, and that we invest in them, continue to invest our time, our effort, our love, the spirit of God to do that, at times even to our own hurt. You know, I, I learned something years ago. Uh, Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers. You, have to, uh, you really have to wage peace. You talk about waging war, you know, going to war, waging war. Well, yeah, that happens, and we know the impact of that, the destruction that creates. But to be a peacemaker in the, in the meaning that Jesus was talking about, you have to wage it. You have to war at peace. Not war and peace, but you have to war at peace. You have to really focus on peace, and it, it takes an effort, more of an effort really to, than, than it does to create uh, conditions that are not peaceful or war. We have to hold our tongue. We have to um, admit we're wrong. We have to um, go the extra mile. We have to choose to... Uh, choose to allow the, the offense maybe to stand at times and suffer for righteousness sake. A lot of things that scripture tells us that we have to do because the bottom line is Christ is not divided. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 13 when Christ asked that or when Paul said is Christ divided it was one of those rhetorical questions. The answer is no. No. Christ isn't divided. But people divide. We sing the song, How Good and How Pleasant. For brethren to dwell, together in unity. Psalm 133. Yeah, it is, it is, it's, it's better to dwell together in unity. Those are things that we have to think about. How do we do it? Well, let me just put out one point on, on that. Just as I said earlier, I came back, just came back from another trip to Africa. And in talking with a few ministers, uh, before, during, and after uh, but that, this trip, uh, just seeking to understand Africa and our churches there and our, our members. Uh, Africa as an experience, it, it's, it's a remarkable place. But in, in looking at what our members have to deal with to hold on to the faith there, which in many cases is some, similar to what we have, obviously human nature doesn't change from continent to continent from uh, ethnicity to ethnicity or race to race. It's all, all the same. But there is something in Africa that is called tribalism. Tribalism. They are, there are tribes in Africa. Uh, they're all black. I'm talking about among the black Africans. Uh, they're all black. But they are from different tribes. And those tribes have just as much pre prejudice among themselves as we will find in any other part of the world of white and black or Asian and American or uh, Asian and black and whatever it might be. And it is a debilitating problem that, I that is endemic to Africa and is part of the problem that has kept the entire continent from developing. But it also impacts our members. I mean, you can be from one tribe and you have two tribes and there is prejudice and feelings of superiority because you are of one tribe and yet they're in the same church. And our ministers that go over are, are senior pastors and work in, in these places with, with uh, the, uh, the African ministers and members have to contend with that unique feature. It's human nature, but it's, it, it's, it's interesting. And again, we, you know, we're, we're inundated with racial talk today and, and the, the, the um, uh, prejudices and, and the problems. And uh, we, we understand the national debate in America about that as well. But um, this is not just here. They have their, uh, its impact there, and they have to deal with it. It's called tri and it's called tribalism. And uh, somebody was explaining it to me a few days ago. And I was talking with one of our elders when I was over on this uh, uh, particular trip, and he was explaining a few things to me. And it, it, um, it inhibits their relationships is, the, is what it does. It creates conflict and, you know, 
sand in the gears that, that creates problems and breaks down the relationships. We have our tribalism in different ways. It's not just related to race or ethnicity. We can become tribal within, the, within this congregation, within the, the church of God as a whole. Paul, Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. He says, some are of Paul, some are of Peter, some are of Christ. There's, the visions, he said, should not be there. But we get into them, and these are the impediments to the unity that we want. And they can be over a, a, an understanding of doctrine. Some have, over, you know, you get one tribe and you identify with a, a part of the, quote, tribe of the church. Because, well, they see the Bible this way. And this is what they do with their life because of this. And so, oh, I like that tribe. And then we have another tribe over here. Well, they can't sing certain hymns in this hymnal because they're too Protestant. So you got another tribe. And then people identify with that tribe. You see what I'm saying? These are the, this is the tribalism we get into in the church, and it puts sand in the gears and creates judgment, division, and it's, a, you know, it, it's, it's the little things then that become bigger things, and they, they rise to higher levels within the church, and they ultimately can rise to division if they're not stopped. And where does it stop? It has to stop with us, you, me and recognize certain other biblical principles that are regularly brought to our attention through, our, through the messages, but we have to stop the tribalism and work to build meaningful relationships if we're going to build the house of faith and the way we look at one another. I'll give a shout out, a shout out to our pastor here. I think he does a pretty good job of, of seeking to build our relationships with activities, Sometimes a few too many, <laughs> but I'm old. <laughs> but so we got something for everybody, all right? And, you know, for some we've got 15 things and five for others, but that's great. But I think he does a pretty good job of, of really putting that before us. And I, I sit here, and I've been a pastor for umpteen years and in the ministry 46, and I appreciate the pastoral care that I get, my wife and I get in this congregation. And I hope you do too, because he's, he's working to, his best to build relationships at all levels, intergenerationally among ourselves. Know your Bible, brethren, not just your tribe, not just someone who agrees with, your, with you. Know your Bible, not your posse. Know your Bible, not just your generation. Know each other. Know the whole congregation. Draw together. Come together. We've got many good opportunities ahead of us to build a household of faith. We really do. Now let's look at a third theme, and that is preparing the next generation. I'm not going to see the 50th anniversary of the United Church of God. Many of us in this room will not, all right? And we're at a on the cusp of a transition right now that is quite, um, it's going to happen. I see it. I've, I've talked to, to you about that in, in uh, previous times. The Bible's full of transitions. You, you see the transition from Moses to Joshua. You see the transition from David to Solomon. You see the transition from El Elijah to El Elisha. I love the transition of Paul to his church at, at, uh, elders in the city of Ephesus, where he wept. They all got down on their knees and fell on one another and wept there in Acts chapter 20. Um, and Paul said, look, I, I just I, I give you guys over. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that's able to keep you. And he, he, he had to go on to Jerusalem, and he knew he wouldn't see them again. That was a big transition. But he commended them to, to God. So there's lots of transitions in, in Scripture. I don't think we're going to have to wait 25 years to see a, a major transition. I think it's probably going to come within 12 years in the United Church of God. There will be a transition to a new generation within 12 years. That's my, my, my guess. Um, and many of you that think I'm you know, just blowing old, old fogey smoke here, uh, will be blowing the same old fogey smoke uh, in, in your positions. 
Trust me, it'll happen. It's happened to me, because I used to hear it, old fogey smoke, whenever I was your age. You like that one? I just made that one up. It just it came just like that, old fogey smoke. Um, but I, I was listening to some Ronald Reagan quotes the other day. I just I happened to pop up on a YouTube feed, and I said, oh, I listened to President Reagan. And he was pretty good with a lot of things. And, and when he was running in 1984 against Walter Mondale for president, his second term, he was well up in his upper 70s, I think, at that time. And they were saying, well, you're too old to be president of the United States, and you can't be in. Walter Mondale was a, a young 55, probably, at that time. And they were making an issue of his age. And uh, President Reagan made this comment. He said, look, he said, I promise that I, I, will, uh, I will not you know, if you don't make an issue of my age, I'm not going to make an issue of my opponent's youth. And he brought, he stopped the whole question, the whole debate on that at, with that particular quip. But he went on to make another comment, he, and he quoted from a, a Roman statesman, a Roman orator from ancient Rome named Cicero, that was really the foundation for his comment. Cicero said, as he was looking at his age back in the time of ancient Rome, and he said, this is a quote, if, it's, if it wasn't for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. If it wasn't for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. This is an age-long issue that just comes up throughout the ages of the transitions and, and making, it, making the handoff effective to preserve the continuity of the community, of the state, of the church. And we're going to have to transition through that. Over the last couple of years, I, being a part of the ministerial services team in conducting the regional conferences, I, I, I gave a talk called Be an Elder at the Gate. And I was, gave this to all the, the elders that came to our regional conferences. Be an Elder at the Gate was what I talk, talked about. And what I did was went back into the Old Testament to show this, the role of the elder at the gate, as you read about it in ancient Israel, the gate being the city hall, the, 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 the county court, uh, where all of the, the judgments and justice and decisions and uh, laws were upheld and, and carried out for the community. And you read about it from uh, the book of Numbers and Leviticus on through the Old Testament, this, this category called the elders. Now, there's one story that I, that we should spend a moment with of, of a group of elders and what it meant to the community that can help us as we look at this here today. And it's from the well-known story that we all know, the story of Ruth, the book of Ruth. We all know the story. Turn, if you will, over to Ruth chapter 4, and I'll summarize the first three chapters as, as we're doing so. But you, you know this beautiful story where, because of a famine, a man named Elimelech from the, the city of, of Bethlehem went to Moab. He crossed over the Jordan, went, went uh, east with his wife Naomi and his two sons Malan and Kilion. They went into Moab and Malan and Kilion married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And then Elimelech dies and Malan and Killian died, and so you have three widows, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. Naomi says, I've got to go, I'm going back home to Bethlehem, to my home, which is, you know, what happens today with people in that type of situation, too. I'll go back to the homestead. I'll go back to my hometown. And Ruth goes with her. Orpah doesn't, and you know the story. Ruth goes. She says, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And, and so they, they go back to Bethlehem. And it's in the time of the barley har harvest. And they, they come to, to the story there in, in um, chapter 4 of the book of Ruth, where Naomi sends Ruth out to the field of Boaz to pick up some grain so that they can make bread and they can eat. Gleaning is what it's called. Uh, we have gleaners uh, harvest and places today where people still glean in many different ways. And it's a good practice. It's a biblical practice. Ruth falls in love with Boaz and, and he with her, but before they can get married, they have to deal with a, a situation dealing with the family of Elimelech. 
because of property and the name and the, the um, it's all tied up with the, the, the law of the Jubilee back in the book of Leviticus, which helps to preserve the, the, the community. But if you know the story in, in chapter 4, they went to the gate, it says in verse 1, which is basically they went to the county court to get this matter resolved of name and property and money so that the way could be go forward because there was another near near kinsman who had a first right of refusal over Ruth. And he had to say up or down whether or not he would take Ruth as his wife. And that's the story. But they, get, they go to the elder, they go up to the gate in verse 1 and they sat down and this elder, close relative of whom Boaz had spoken, it says, came. And Boaz said to him, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he, he took ten men of the elders of the city, in verse 2. And he said, sit down here. So they sat down. And then they go through the proceeding. This is kind of a, a civil, judicial, a legal matter that they have to go through. But the elders are the, the judges. They are the clerks of the court. They are the ones who are responsible for seeing that the business of the law that govern the community in that day is adhered to by the people and the families. And as you know the story, the relative whose name is not even given to us, he says, I don't want her because it's going to complicate my, my family and my inheritance and my money. And so the way is open for Boaz then to step in as the next in line, and he marries Ruth. And it's a beautiful story. It is filled with so much teaching for us. But on this particular point, it shows us the importance of these elders of the city, the laws, the responsibilities that had to be maintained to build not only um, Bethlehem, but really a, a spiritual community, and also to pass on and to keep intact the generations, the harmony, the social st structure of, of the, the community of, of the, uh, here in, in Bethlehem. Uh, if you skip down to verse 11, after it was finally decided, it says, all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house, like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And may your house be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Now, you know the rest of the story. Boaz and Ruth are in the line that eventually leads to King David and thus to Jesus Christ. And when you understand the importance of what they did this day in Bethlehem in upholding the, the law of God that bound together the, the community of Bethlehem and therefore the, the entire tribe and nation into harmony and a social compact, everybody knew one another. They knew each other's families, and they adhered to it and it worked, and it preserved that generation, the name of Elimelech, his family, and created a, then a, a new house, if you will, of Boaz and Ruth, on which eventually God was able to place into another family of Mary and Joseph, his son, the Word incarnate. Decisions that are made today impact the years ahead of us and the next generation. We're, we're preparing for the next generation right now. And we have a way of life to perpetuate. And our part in doing that in, in the, is part of the inheritance of, of God. This is how a household of faith stands its ground in the midst of a time and ensures transition. I, I began today talking about the time that we're living in the hostility to biblical truth, and that we are going to have to hold to that even more so in our personal lives and demonstrating that as well as at the same time preaching it so that when people come into our midst looking for a safe place from the tragedies of their own life put upon them because of this culture and this society, they find a people of faith who are adhering to the, to the teaching given to them by this generation. We're preparing that now. And it 
is in, in our minds and in our hearts. Elders, in this case, that were figures of authority and experience, they respected God's law, they respected tradition, they respected family, reputation, and honor. Rather than are we listening, those of you that want to take my place, those of you that want to take Mr. Meyer's place, are you listening? There'll be a time when you will. A few years ago, I came to a point, I said to somebody who, who wanted my place in another, another congregation, I said, I'd give it to you if I could, but I can't. But I don't think you know what you're asking for. But some of you will be in, in, in this place. I had to put in my time. Be sure that you will have to put your time in as well. And we will make this transition together. The future of the United Church of God is filled with promise. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, this is the promise. Ephesians 4 verse 16. This is the promise that we have. Ephesians 4, and verse 16. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This forms the basis of the vision statement that we have taken for the United Church of God a body joined and knit together, every joint supplying something to the working that we all share and have a part in, growing together in love or into a meaningful relationship. That is the promise that we have. 25 years has, has just laid a foundation for it. We said we would, 25 years ago, we said we would prepare a home for the people of God at that point who were scattering because of doctrinal confusion. We said we would keep the faith, provide for the keeping of the faith and the Sabbath and the holy days, and we have done that. And we said we would preach the gospel. And those mandates then are themes that we can build on today. So let's be a part of that. Our calling is to be an instrument in that body of Christ that is the church that's being prepared as a bride. And let's be a part of that. And let's be about our Father's business as we seek to build for the next 25 years.